And now it is my great pleasure to welcome to the microphone so that we may be inspired, uplifted, transformed, and blessed. Our beloved pastor, Reverend John Scott, the beloved. sacred assignment for our women, from the womb to the tomb. Can we say thank you God for our women? Can we say that for our eyes? Thank you God for our women. And so the story continues in Mark chapter 16 verses 1 to 6. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came onto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. In Luke's version of the resurrection, two men in dazzling clothes, presumably angels, are sitting inside the empty tomb. The women report this to Peter, who runs to see for himself. John also offers a slightly different account of the first Easter. In this version, Mary Magdalene goes alone, finds the empty tomb, and races back to tell Peter the news. Later, she weeps at the empty tomb, and two angels in white ask her why she's crying. And there, she meets Jesus face to face, initially mistaking him for the gardener. Jesus calls her name, and she, realizing who he, he is and what has happened, says, can you imagine her joy? Is really you for true? <laughs> we cannot believe it. And so the story is different. You know, friends, from the earliest times, Christianity itself was divided over the question of Jesus' identity. 
his life, his death, and subsequent resurrection. In no time at all, the church became a feuding, bickering bunch of thinkers who were all contributing their own take on the life and death of the master teacher. So almost from the start, like sects like the Gnostics held views that separated them completely from the Orthodox, Orthodox Church views. In modern times, there have been Christian theologians who have asserted that most of the words attributed to Jesus were just creations of the people who wrote the Gospels. At the other extreme end of the spectrum are Christians who believe every single word of the Bible, including the New Testament. They are firm in their belief in the inerrancy of Scripture and insist that each word is divine truth and should be literally followed. Now, Author Kenneth C. Davis, in his very witty bestseller uh, titled Don't Know Much About the Bible, notes that this business of following, believing every word of the Bible as being absolutely true can be a risky business. He tells a joke about an old time fundamentalist who liked to just open the Bible at random and do exactly what he read. And so one Good Friday, he flipped around in the good book and found, and Judas hung himself. <laughs> so he quickly turned on another page and read, Go down and do likewise. <laughs> you see, you can't take it word for word, and there are many different versions. Obviously, we were telling, all of you left here this morning, and you were telling the story about this morning's Easter service. Each of you would take a different version of what Reverend John said, yes? Some people remember the jokes only. Some people said, no, it was wonderful. And when you say to them, well, what did he talk about? Well, no, it was just wonderful. <laughs> some people follow the assignment, word for word, just like we said. And some said, shh, what do we do? You can't get up there and say anything you want. <laughs> Bishop John Shelby Spong, who's one of my favorite um, Orthodox um, bishops, who is very unorthodox in his views. In a book titled Rescuing the Bible from Fundamentalism, notes that there are many inconsistencies in the gospel narratives about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. You know, I've never been able to understand, for example, why there's this big blue ha ha about whether he was born in December or born in September. I know about all the details of his life. I used to say to my mom when I was a child, but even the Queen of England has an official birthday different to her actual birth date. So, you know, what's, what's the big deal? The argument has gone on for centuries, but there's so much more to the story of this incredible man, the beautiful Jesus. Ever so much more that is contained in these often limiting narratives about his life. Too often we bicker about the details and miss the message, don't you? His message was unconditional love, non-judgment, forgiveness, brotherhood, and peacefulness. It doesn't matter. Even the whole story of the Easter, the Easter myth, you know, it doesn't matter. He never said, worship me, he said, Follow me. Do as I do, and your life will be a resurrection into the light of your true divinity. So the story of the power of Easter is for me real and eternal, although maybe not literally. It is the story of a human life in which the limits of finitude were broken proving that birth and death are, as Deepak Chopra put it, and I quote, but parentheses in the continuum of God's eternal love, unquote. The writers of the gospel, the gospels, interpreted Jesus' life and teaching in the light of the culture, norms, beliefs, and practices of their day. We are called to also interpret his life for our modern era, to answer the question, who is Christ for us today? What is the meaning of our sonship and daughtership with Almighty God? And how do we live that? The science of my teaching 
views Jesus as one who exemplified the principle of life in action. Simply put, the master teacher in Weishoa walked the talk and demonstrated the power of mind as the power of God in each one of us. His teaching is an awesome representation of the way you and I may transform our own lives through the changing of our consciousness. Yes, each of us puts on the Christ to the degree that we surrender a limited sense of life to the divine realization of our unity with God. We are one with God, and this is what Jesus taught. You know, when I first came across the metaphysical meaning of the cross, I was intrigued to learn that the horizontal aspect symbolizes the crossing out of error, the crossing out of negative thinking, false beliefs, and superstition. The vertical aspect symbolizes the ascension of spirit from within us to without. In other words, as we raise the cross, we are exposing any false beliefs in our subconscious minds to the light of the truth that sets us free. When that takes place, my friends, the spirit is resurrected through us and flows, ascending as a new transforming experience of truth made manifest in our world and our affairs. And so when the sun rose on the morning of Jesus' resurrection, the tomb was empty. He was not there. Much emphasis has been placed upon the agony of the pattern but for me, that was purely a means to an end which was set up by the Master himself. And I personally believe that given his awesome control of mind over body and over affairs, he, could, he might well have just shifted his consciousness away from what appears to us as the human side to be an agonizing experience, shifted his consciousness from that so that there was no pain and there was no passion, no agony. And already his mind was, was just filled with the light and the love that caused him to say to the thief, this day, not tomorrow, not some future time, but in you know, some future place, this day, wilt thou be with me in paradise. The resurrection then is a willingness to open yourself up to a new life. It is surrendering oneself to that spirit of life within you that is mightier than the outer circumstances, including illness and death. Let us say to our past, it is finished. It is finished, my friends, for the message of the resurrection is that we can choose the higher way. We can decide upon our spiritual wholeness. We can get off our crosses of confusion and rise up out of our own tombs of negative thinking to mentally move into the Easter dawn of enlightened, empowered, and beautiful lives. For the remainder of this Easter holiday and the coming week then, I want you to allow the idea of personal resurrection to take root in your consciousness. I want you to think about what your life would be like if you were resurrected above all the challenges hmm. and the, the negative ideas that have plagued those that have walked with you for many a year. Choose to live as an example of the dynamic principle of life and walk the talk of truth in every area of your living. And so here is your assignment. Should you choose to undertake it, your mission is to pick a part of you that you would like to change. To pick a part of your personality that no longer works for you. You know? All of us are working on issues, aren't we? Of one sort or another. So I want you to pick a part. It may be jealousy, it may be anger, it may be impatience, which is my own challenge. It may be resentment, it may be judgment, it may be anxiety, it may be power struggles with your partner, your spouse, your children, or even your friends. This week, work on rising above it. 
set your intention to heal this part of your personality. And I'll tell you how to do it. It's not. When this part becomes active, and it will become active from time to time, challenge it by refusing to do what you usually do. That way you break the neural networks that have formed over the years. You know, your, your default response is to go to anger, or to go to jealousy, or to go to whatever it is. When you feel that part of you rising, just take a deep breath, stop and say, no, I break through the tomb of human limitation by choosing love instead. I break through the tomb of human limita limitation by choosing love instead. Can we say that together? I break through the tomb of human limitation by choosing love I'm not convinced you sound very thank you, thank you. <laughs> Can I hear it said with passion and conviction? I, I break through the tomb of human limitation by choosing love instead. You do it. My friends, the Easter celebration is for all humanity. For we are all expressions of the infinite spirit. Let it be your Easter joy to choose to transcend limitations and accept our resurrections into lives of dynamic health, abundant prosperity, loving relationships, and the freedom to use our talents in ways that benefit the human family. In the Science of Mind textbook, page 369, for those who like to research, religious science founder Dr. Ernest Holmes writes of the triumph of Christ, and I quote, the Christ knows that his individuality is indestructible, that he is an eternal being living forever in the bosom of the Father. The Christ triumphs over death and the grave, breaking through the tomb of human limitation into the dawn of eternal expansion. The Christ rises from the ashes of human hopes, pointing the way to a greater realization of life. The Christ is always triumphant, is ever a victor, is never defeated, needs no champion. The Christ places his hand in the outstretched, outstretched hand of the universe and walks unafraid through life." Unquote. This is my Easter prayer for you and for my, my spiritual family and for all humankind. I see us all resurrected to a greater awareness of our own sacredness, to our spiritual connection with God, and our unlimited potential as spiritual beings. And so I will close with an Easter poem written by 19th century English author Emily Bronte. And these were the last words Emily ever wrote. Her poem is titled, The Easter Promise. And I have titled this morning's encouragement. The Easter promise. No coward soul is mine, no trembler in the world's storm troubled fair sphere. I see heaven's glories shine, and faith shines equal, arming me from fear. O God within my breast, almighty, ever present deity, life that in me has rest, as I on dying life have poured in thee. Vain are the thousand creeds that move people's hearts unutterably vain. Worthless as withered weeds or eyeless froth amid the bondless main. To waken doubt in one, holding so fast to thine infinity, so surely anchored on the steadfast rock of immortality. With wide embracing love, thy spirit animates eternal years, pervades and broods above, changes, sustains, dissolves, creates, and rears. Though earth and moon were gone, and suns and universes ceased to be, and thou wert left alone, every existence would exist in thee. There is not room for death, nor atom that his might could render void. Thou, 
Thou art being and bread, and what thou art may never be destroyed. May the Christ in you, your eternal, indestructible connection to God, make this Easter a personal resurrection for each of you. Happy Easter. Namaste.